All right, so now we are going to begin with our opening prayer. And uh, would anyone like to pray for us so that we can begin? You can raise your hand and um, then go ahead and pray. Okay, I see um, Grayson, you can go ahead. You can go ahead and, and pray. Dear, dear Jesus, thank you for your gifts for us. Hope we have a wonderful world. Thank you for what you made. Amen. 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 I'm going to go ahead and say a prayer as well. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you've gathered all the children and youth here today so that we can sit at your feet and learn about you. We pray your presence to abide with us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I want to welcome every one of you to Heaven is a Happy Place, Children and Youth Sabbath School. It's wonderful to have you here, the familiar faces that come every week. And those of you who are joining us for the first time, we welcome you. Those of you who um, it's been a while since you've been on and you're now coming again. Thank you, Grayson, for joining us today. Uh, I see Ty and Taija and um, the whole family there, we, we, we haven't seen you um, in a while, but you've been joining us for the last couple of weeks, and it's so wonderful to have you all back. Um, I hope I'm not missing anyone, but it's, it's always a pleasure for us to come together um, Sabbath afternoon. So everyone, welcome. We're now going to sing our welcome song. And is there anyone that would like to say their name? in the welcome song. In the chat box, Addison oh, okay. wants to say it. Oh, good. Okay, wonderful, Adam wants to say it. Thank you. Okay. Welcome both girls and boys to your Sabbath school of joy. Heaven is a happy place for us. Let us smile and sing and give thanks for everything as we talk about our Lord Jesus. Pay attention, friends, to today's lesson. Listen closely to God's word. Come and sing along as we sing our Sabbath song. Heaven is a happy place for us. I'm a pilgrim, I'm a pilgrim down in this dark and sinker's earth. I am heading to my home above, where there's no disgrace. Heaven is a happy place. I am heading to my home above. I am heading there to that land so fair, to that beautiful land of light. Tell me what's your name? Chris, Corn Corn Tom, Adam Dennis. Will you join me up for train and come with me to the home above? On my way to there, I see children everywhere. Are they headed to that home above? Where the air is so sweet, my Lord Jesus, I shall meet. I would like. Chris, Corn Corn Tom. Adam, there. <laughs> there, we will be all right in that land of light where there shall be no more night, no more tears, no more pain. We shall never part again. Heaven is a place of great delight. Welcome. Okay, so we are now going to transition to Nicole. Hello, everyone. I pray everyone is having a great Sabbath. And again, my name is Sister Nicole, for those of you who do not know. But we are going to talk about our lesson for 
today and also for next Sabbath. So who wants to read the title of our lesson today? A Touch of Faith. A okay. Touch of Faith. Good. Thank you very much, Craig and Johanna. <laughs> so it's called A Touch of Faith and is taken from Desire of Ages, chapter 36. So we have our memory verse. And who would like to say our memory verse for us? And, see, huh? go ahead. and behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. Matthew chapter 9, verse 20 to 21. Good. Thank you very much. And if you have your card, who has their card? It's all on the back of your card. Very good. Okay, so your memory verse and your character quality are found on the back of your card. And you can use this throughout the week to help you remember it, okay? And our character quality, who can say that word for us? Oh, yes, yes. Say it again. Illness. All right, earnestness. <laughs> so Noah even tried to take a step to take a take a chance at saying that. It's earnestness. So who has heard of that word before? Let me see your hands. Has anyone heard of it before? No? Okay, so who would like to maybe guess? Craig, you, you have something? Being respectable. I'm sorry, go ahead and say it again. Being respectable. Being respectable? Okay, I could see it in that, in that respect, okay? So being a true, respectable person. But that's actually not the definition we're looking for in this case, okay? Does anybody else want to try? It means, it means, it means happy. Happy? Mm, no. <laughs> not quite, not quite. Okay, I see, I see another hand. Go ahead, Craig. It means sincerity. Very good. You got it. You, no, hit, no, you no, hit it. You hit it. No, you hit the no, nail right on the head, okay? It means sincerity. Very good. And that's another big word. So hopefully we're going to get to the bottom of this, right? So go ahead and read that. Who wants to read that for us? A person having made peace with God, lovely submit to his will for their life. The act of being compli compliant and accepting Jesus is in control because you trust him to deliver you in the way he knows best. Okay. So in all truth... In all submission, right? With everything that you know and believe, that's what earnestness is, okay? And you know what? I think we've got a little technical error here, okay? <laughs> hmm, right. <laughs> so thank you very much. So this is the time when you really need your card, right? So let's go ahead and read that from the card to correct our technical error. Go ahead, Johanna. You want to read that? Earnestness, a genuine sincerity and deep, deep conviction which leads to a person to focus every thought, action, and motive on obtaining our des their desired goal. Earnestness finds its truest exp ex expression in the lives of those who seek to overcome every ob obstacle. Ob obstacle? Obstacle mm -hmm. that would separate them from Jesus. Very good. Okay, so it's a genuine sincerity, just as Craig said. Like Say that again. That sounds like more the definition. Yeah, one. <laughs> that one works. <laughs> so sorry, guys. Okay, we're going to fix that for next time, right? So it's a genuine sincerity, a, a deep conviction, okay? It's something within you to where you want to do we want to focus every thought and action to, towards your goal, okay? And in this story, we'll see what that goal is. The goal is reaching Jesus. So when we believe with all of our hearts and give everything we have to, to, to find Jesus, to obtain Jesus, 
that's, that's being done in earnestness. Okay. So as we go through the lesson, we're going to explain more and more so that we can all understand what this word truly means. All right. Okay, thank you, Sister Nicole. We're now going to transition to our memory song by Brother Andrew. Hello, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to see you all again this Sabbath. I pray that you had a blessed week, and um, I have a song, as Sister Donna said, titled Seas The Seasons of Our Lives. I uh, wrote this song when a lady a sister in the faith told me, um, why not make a song about nature and the seasons uh, of the year and relate that to your life? And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. So I ended up writing the song a few years ago, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you all and that you can learn it too, maybe. The seasons of the year are like the seasons of our lives. Spring, summer, fall, and winter teaches more than meets the eyes. There is in them a lesson that gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the simple. As you learn, you'll be surprised. Discern the truth in nature as the flowers bud in spring. Acknowledge your creator, feel the heat that summer brings. Behold, the autumn season is the time when most plants die. The winter shall not last for long, for springtime draweth nigh. <coughs> As seasons come and go, so human life has come and gone. There is a time and season for all done under the sun. A newborn is likened to spring, and autumn tells of age. The summer speaks of vibrant youth, winter the dying stage. Discern the truth in nature as the flowers bud in spring. Acknowledge your creator, feel the heat that summer brings. Behold, the autumn season is the time when most plants die. The winter shall not last for long, for springtime draweth nigh. Amen. There's more. Uh, the onset of our Christian walk when we were babes in Christ is similar to springtime when the plants bring forth new life. The summer of our growth in Christ is shown as we bear fruit. The autumn of our walk with him brings death to evil roots. Discern the truth in nature as the flower Hours, but in spring, acknowledge your creator, feel the heat that summer brings. Behold, the autumn season is the time when most plants die. The winter shall not last for long, for springtime draweth nigh. The winter months are cold, indeed those days can give us chills. So also does our life have trials, heartaches, griefs, and ills. The good news is that very soon our winter life shall pass. That never-ending spring of endless life shall come at last. Discern the truth in nature as the flowers bud in spring. Acknowledge your creator, feel the heat that summer brings. Behold, the autumn season is the time when most plants die. The winter shall not last for long, for springtime draweth nigh. Amen. amen amen such a beautiful song that makes us appreciate the seasons amen we are now going to move in to our nature section 
And I'm gonna ask Brother Neil if he can now come on. Hello, happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm so glad that everyone is here today. So for our um, character quality for this week, we have earnestness. So I really like that word because in life, it takes, it takes one to be earnest for, for you to go and have a lot of passion and, and have the ability to succeed in life when, um, when you have a set goal to the point that you would do all kinds of crazy things just to achieve that goal. And people who are very earnest many times will, will work really, really hard for that goal. Just like the Lord, um, when he, when he uh, saw that the world was good before his eyes, he continued to work for the next um, six days nonstop, seeing how he was very pleased with it. And he was earnest to complete it until he was satisfied on the seventh day. And so there are a lot of examples again in, in nature where, uh, where um, there is uh, earnestness displayed by the animals that the Lord has created. And I'd like to show um, a different kinds of examples of these animals. So let me get my, let me get my, notes right here and i got and these animals i've uh i've heard about throughout the years and i i just thought that they were very very interesting and in how uh how these animals would go through so many lengths to achieve their goal or to help achieve a goal with their community and they would go through so many hardships and work for days on end just to just to achieve what they wanted to do. So what I have here first is a mountain goat. I'm sure many of you have heard of a mountain goat or maybe have seen one, but here as an example, if you can try imagining this, right there's a, right there's a mountain goat. Wait, let me Hi, bring it up. Hello? You, you talked about mountain goats, I've seen one before. Oh yeah, that's good. That's nice in real life. Or in, in the uh, zoo. Oh, in the zoo. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that's so nice. I've never actually seen one before, but I've seen one in documentaries. There you go. I just made the brightness a little bit higher. Or it might it, it might be a little too high. But right there you go. Right there is a mountain goat. Just like you said. And the hopefully that's the hopefully it's almost the same type of mountain goat that you saw in the zoo. But for this example. I wanted to talk about how amazing the mountain goat is in their natural habitat and what they do on a daily basis. So for their example of earnestness, I wanted to talk about how, how in their daily diet, uh, in their daily diet um, they lack salt. And one of the ways that they would have to achieve um, uh, one of the ways they would have to get that salt is by climbing very, very steep mountains. And these hillsides on the, have usually water dripping on the side from um, leftover rain. And the water has taken apart from the rocks little bits of salt and it's trickling down the steep hill. And so most of the time, these hills are almost 90 degrees. 90 degrees meaning that it's straight up and down from the ground, but it's just a little bit tilted. And these hills can go upwards to 80 degrees, which is around this, this steep. So imagining, imagine trying to climb something this steep. It's really, really steep. And sometimes you can find these mountain goats um, climbing really steep uh, dams just to get 
the the salt are stuck on the side of the wall and they would they would risk their lives just to climb these really stiff steep walls just to get the little portion of salt that's necessary for their for their um diet so that they can survive because uh it's important that you have salt in your body or else you'll start to all or you start to get weak and die and so I have another example here, an Arctic tern. An Arctic tern is a white bird and it looks just like this. Let me see, let me show it to you. Right there's an Arctic tern. And so for this example of the Arctic tern, I mean, for this example for earnestness, I wanna talk about how, how hardworking it is when it comes to wanting to migrate thousands and thousands of miles. So when the season changes and um, the seasons start to become warm or, or, or cold, they will fly upwards to 12,000 to 50,000 miles in 90 days. So <laughs> within, that, within that much, they would have been able to travel across the country of the United States multiple times because uh from i remember when i wanted to go to the philippines it's around it's around um i think i, I think it was eighteen thousand miles from the jfk airport all the way to japan where we would have to stop by that's only eighteen thousand miles but imagine traveling fifty thousand miles in 90 days and they would go from around greenland or wherever distance they are all the way to to the Antarctic. And so my other example here are honeybees. And I'm sure many of you have already seen honeybees in the springtime. They're, they're so abundant. You see them all the time on the flowers. And just as a recap, they look like this. Right there in the, the yellow one right there. Those are honeybees. So except for the queen bee, I'm talking about the honeybee that goes out to get the honey. They work for 10 hours a day for six days a week. So that would be up to that would be up to 60 hours a week, nonstop, just working on the clock. And for that entire week, they would have at least come across 8,000 flowers. But with all that hard work, it only it only got them around five ounces, or at least this probably this much honey because from all the nectar they got from the flower from the flowers it would have been this much but after it evaporated although the only honey that's left over is this much same thing with maple syrup if when you if you've ever made maple syrup you have to boil a lot of the of the syrup itself but your only your only um remaining syrup is only just a little bit compared to a whole gallon and then my second to final example here, I have an ant. I'm sure that many of you have already seen ants. I was hoping to um, go outside, but uh, outside is just, uh, it's just snow for me. But I wanted to show you these different kinds of animals, but I guess I just didn't have it. I don't think it was the weather to show it. But for these ants, they work up to 12 hours a day. And actually, not even actually, well, not 12 hours a week. They work almost up to 22 hours a day. And around eight minute rests between 12 hours, or they take 250, 250 breaks a day, but those breaks only last one minute. And um, they work nonstop and they can lift little rocks or sticks or little leaves that are 50 times their, their own weight. They're really, really strong. And so for my final example, which I thought was really interesting, are emperor penguins. If anyone here has ever seen a documentary about emperor penguins or have seen the movie Happy Feet, um, I'm sure many of you have already heard of the emperor penguin, but let me show you just an example. So you can have a visual of how, how the emperor penguin looks like right there. That's the adult version, or that's that should be the father right there looking over the 
they're little chicks right there when they're younger. Their their um their gray feathers will will come out as they age, and they'll end up looking like their parent over there. But it's a really interesting story. So what I've written down here is that the penguins, the mother and father, they stay together for life. And the when the mother lays an egg, they the mother hasn't eaten for a couple of months and they lost around a third of their weight just um just uh just waiting for the egg uh, for her egg to come out and so they the mother gives the egg to the father for the father to take care for the next four months without leaving the egg behind and taking care of the egg between the legs they would they would sit on top of the egg or kind of roll over the egg and all the other father emperor penguins would huddle together to conserve the warmth during the cold um, season. While the mother would travel for two months to go to the ocean, which is 50 miles away. And just to get as much fish as she could possibly eat and um, carry within her stomach. And return again for another two months journey back to their back to their. Um, uh, to their home where the father emperor penguin is with their chick so that she could feed the the newly hatched chick the the fish that she caught that was uh, that she stored within her stomach two months ago and at this point the father penguin is very very weak it's been four months since he last ate and he lost half of his weight so he would leave the family again um, just to go out and eat so for the earnestness of being really good um, parents, they would go through so many lengths just to, just to feed at least one to three of their, uh, actually just to feed one chick at a time because they're only taking care of one egg at a time. And uh, it's, a little bit, uh, it's, it's sometimes a little bit more common if, if they take care of more than one chick. But... These are the different kinds of examples of earnestness in nature that you can find how these animals would go through so many lengths just to achieve their goal or to to help their community or to help their, their, their family members or to go to certain distances. And so if you apply this, this um, character trait to your life, earnestness, I'm sure that many of you will, will have all kinds of achievements in the future. And the Lord, when you read the Bible, he gives you all kinds of reasons why you should become earnest in your life. And being earnest can help train your, train your, your mind and your soul to continue persevering forth in the near upcoming future for any, for any challenges that you may um, come across in your life. And so... It's important that uh, you keep faith, remember the Lord's word, stay earnest, and and travel on forth. And that'll be our nature's lesson for today. Thank you, Brother Neil. Thank you very much. You were certainly encouraged to be have earnestness through all the different um, examples given in the creation. Okay, we are now going to transition to our um, Adventist Pioneer mission session. All right, so um, I'm going to say a short word of prayer before we, we move on. Father in heaven, as we uh, take a moment to study the pioneers, we pray that you would open our hearts to learn uh, about John Harvey Kellogg in Jesus name. Amen. So who can remember uh, what Adventist pioneer are we studying for the month of February? John Harvey Kellogg. Yes, George Harvey Kellogg. Wonderful. All right, let's see if you can remember certain facts about who John Harvey Kellogg was. And uh, if you have a, if you, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and let's see how much you can remember from our past lessons. Okay, so 
we mentioned about um, Mr. Kellogg's father. Can anybody remember what he did for a living and how many children um, did, they, did, did he have all together? I see Johanna raising her hand. You can go ahead. He, 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 he made the brooms for a living and he had 16 children. Okay, very good, very accurate. Okay, so um, we also mentioned last week, we talked about uh, a sanitarium and what it meant, what it is. Does anybody want to share, it, share with us what a sanitarium is? A uh, place of healing. Very good, very good. Does anybody want to add to that? It's like a hospital. Okay, so it's a place, it's, it's kind of like a hospital, but the, the thing is that um, when we go there, it's, it's like a blend of things. You know, it's like a lifestyle center where people go uh, there um, to, to be educated about health, to maintain good health. And some people often go there for leisure. So it's like a hotel blended with um, uh, people often go there to relax and to rejuvenate themselves. So these are the things that uh, Mr. Kellogg intended when um, you know he was inspired to uh, have the sanitarium. And okay, I have two more questions for you. What type of machines did uh, Kellogg invent? Can anybody remember what kind of machines? A light therapy. Okay. okay. Very good. He developed exercising machines, the pedal bike thing, the horseback type of all those type of things. It was like a room. Some of the things that they have were in the Titanic. Very good. Very good. You all remember it, a lot of the details. Okay. So um, what type of food did Kellogg make that was very easy, that was uh, easily to digest? Uh, anyone want to share? Corn flakes, graham uh, crackers. Very good. Very good. All right. So we're going to go into some more information for today. We're going to learn um, some more things about Kellogg. Okay. So today we're going to talk about, I'm sorry, did you have your hand raised? Johanna, you wanted to say something. You can go ahead. He made protos. Say that again. He made protos. Protos? A meat substitute. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Very good. Yes, sure did. All right. Thank you for sharing that with us. Okay. So today we're going to learn about John Harvey Kellogg, um, the surgeon, because he was a surgeon. And as we see here um, in, in the picture, uh, this is how surgery would look like uh, back in the early um the early days of what I think this was around maybe 1910. Um, this is not exactly Kellogg and his staff, but this is a picture to sh give you, show you exactly to have an idea of how it would look like. All right. And so um, Kellogg was distinguished for uh, his surgery because of the diet that he had many of his patients. Um, they had a vegetarian healthy diet before surgery and then after surgery. And so because of that, uh, at, the, at the time that he lived in, where most people would die if they had surgery and well-known men, even in England, who were very well at, um, very well surgeons in that day, they were not as efficient as Kellogg was blessed to be. And he set the record for 165 successive abdominal surgeries without fatality. Now, back then, in those days, that was huge, okay? Because most people would die after surgery. They had lack of um, proper instruments. And many of the things, um, when we think about sanitarium, we also think about hygiene. So many of the things that we often take for granted Okay, let's see if anyone can remember this. When you come outside from play and before you eat, what do you need to do? Wash your hands. 
Wow, see, this is very common. So we, this is something that we know for today. But back then, uh, this is, they didn't, weren't very, very well aware of um, these sanitary behaviors. And so uh, Kellogg was elected to the American College of Surgeons. And this is, you know, the highest um, that anyone can be of a surgeon in, in, in the U.S. So he was a privilege to be a part of that. Um, during his lifetime, Kellogg performed 22,000 operations. His last was at the age of 88. Okay, so he, you know, the, he was, his mind was pretty sharp and he was able to do that. He was well known for his accurate and neat stitches. And he was so, you know, he, he wanted so well to be so good at stitching that he would, when he was traveling on a train, he would take the napkins that were on the, tr um, on the train and he would practice to stitch in anywhere. He would not sit idle. He would just practice stitching to see how perfect of a stitch he can get. And um, many of the, the doctors knew when he completed his work because they can see the neatness and accuracy of, of his surgery um, was very much appreciated. All right, so we're gonna uh, move on. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the Battle Creek Sanitarium, all right? So before we had the Battle Creek San um, Sanitarium, we had um, the, health the Health Institute, right? That James White um, and Ellen White that they uh, started. I have a little picture here, not sure if you could see it quite clearly, but this was the original institute. It looks kind of like a little home. I didn't have, um, it looks more like a, 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 a house that was, you know, pretty huge. It's, it was called the Western Health uh, Reform Institute of Battle Creek, okay? And then Kellogg, um, he, they had placed him, he came back from medical college and they placed him in charge and he renamed it the Battle Creek Sanitarium and then um, they saw that because of the influx of people that was coming in, that they needed to build more. But what Kellogg did, he had something huge in mind. So he actually studied similar institutes in the country. Um, and he his, his building was described as a mammoth. And that means that it was huge, okay? I don't know if you see the picture in the, um, um, on the screen there. Does that look very huge? Yes, it does. It's pretty huge. And so this building was dedicated um, in April 10th, 1878. And they started to work right away on um, that same, that same year, they opened a school of hygiene, um, a school of hygiene open in the sanitarium. And in 1881, what happened in 1881? Can somebody go ahead and read the screen? I want you all to participate a little bit more. Offer lectures for those who wanted to enter some first class medical college. Yes. So they offered lectures. So this was the place that people went. If you wanted to become a medical student and you wanted to get firsthand, very well experienced, then this is where they would go at Battle Creek Sanitarium. All right. So what happened in 1885? Someone go ahead. Added five new stories. Right. So they added five stories to the building. So they got bigger. Uh, it made it even bigger. Right. And in 1889, um, the sanitarium began the health and temperance missionary school. So they had a lot of different things um, going on at the sanitarium. It was a very busy place. And as we know, many people um, came from all over um, to visit the sanitarium. All right. But something happened. And before I say anything, can you tell me based on the picture what happened? In the early morning hours of February 18th, 1902, the Battle Creek Sanitarium and Hospital burned to the ground. The cause of the fire was never determined. Thank you so much, Craig, for reading that to us. And so, yes, the Battle Creek Sanitarium, it burned to the ground, right? And so um, only one person passed, died because of it, uh, the fire. And 
Uh, everyone else was able to survive the fire. And the only reason why this person died is because after being taken out, they actually went back in to get their wallet. And so that's how they were died. So this was a, a very, um, you know, sad event that happened um, when the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Does anyone know um, uh, or any reason um, to why um, the Lord permit this to happen? Let's see, before we get to the next slide, if anyone know a little bit more of the history. I see, uh, Yahani, did you have your hand raised? Did you want to share something? Because they came, became too business-minded. Right, yes, that's one of the reasons why. Very good. They were going against, they were going against God's will. Very good, very good, yes. Any, any other reasons? All right. Thank you all for sharing. Those are very good answers. Let's see. All right. The Battle Creek Sanitarium, um, the, why it was burned to the ground. And this is um, some excerpt from um, Ellen White's writing and, and what she shared. She said, the Lord has permitted the burning of the Review and Herald and the Sanitarium. We're going to get into the Review and Herald um, next time. But on, we're focusing on the sanitarium and thus remove the greatest object uh, objection of moving out of Battle Creek. Instead of rebuilding one large sanitarium, our people should plant in several places. And so what happened was that everything was concentrated in this huge building and the Lord um, didn't want it to that uh, that sanitarium and the building and the work that was going to be there to be the focus. There was much more other fields to cover. All right. Um, instead of rebuilding one large sanitarium, our people should plant in several places. These smaller sanitariums should be established where land could be secured for agricultural purposes. Okay. So God's plan was agriculture uh, to connect to the sanitariums and the school. All right. I see two people raise their hand. Um, did you have anything to say? Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is one of the reasons. And yes, some of the reasons um, that you all mentioned as well, because uh, Kellogg, what he adapted was the whole idea of undenominational, right? And so his focus was more on, on the gain of, as you had said money and prosperity and less on the focus of what God would have them to do which was to proclaim the three angels message and we're going to get a little bit in, into that on the next slide all right um oh, go ahead on February 18th this year it was the anniversary of Battle Creek Sanitarium burning down oh I didn't even realize that that is true it would have happened this week or Yes, it, it, it is. And it just so happened that we're studying at, about it at the same time. Wow. Thank you for making that connection. <laughs> so what happened now is that let's look at this building that we have on the next page. Does it look even bigger than the one that we saw before? What happened? <laughs> okay. It's more extravagant. And it's even more bigger than the building that we saw before, all right? And so this is what, um, in May 1902, what Ellen White wrote. It says, last night I was instructed to tell you, which is Kellogg, that the great display you are making in Battle Creek is not after God's order. So this was not God's will for um, this building to be so huge. And if you can take a look inside, um, it looks, it, it was huge, okay? Um, Ellen White Council was to build a smaller, more simple building, one whose beauty of its Christian atmosphere would not outshine by the beauty of the physical appearance, all right? And so God is teaching us that also, that we should, um, in our manners and the way we carry ourselves, that we should have... Um, Christian deportment, everything that we do should reflect Christ and how he was and the character that he had. All right. And so Kellogg lost a little bit of his focus 
Um, and Ellen White, she she saw him as a son. She wrote, there's so many letters. When I went and I saw, she wrote letter after letter, so many letters to Kellogg, trying to reach out. And as you see, it starts with again and again. That means that it's, it's more than once, more than twice, all right? Again and again, you were presented to me. Let me see if I can, can someone go ahead and read that first paragraph? I have something blocked in the screen, go ahead. One of the children. It's just blocking me too. Okay, it's blocking you. Okay, let me see if I can take care of that. Okay. Again and again, you are presented to me, carrying a banner that did not bear the signature of the truth in these last days. It's coming back. Okay, you you got you you got it though. You were able to read you read the first paragraph. Thank you. All right, so. Um, a banner is something that you show when you want to everyone to see who you're representing. And so what Kellogg was doing, he was more representing the medical field of the world and all the glories of the world, but less of the truth that was to be carried for the last days, okay? The truth is losing its peculiar holy character in the sanitarium in America. And so this is what was written to him March 12th. Um, 1900. Kellogg's money and talent should not divert the principal work, the truth of the tree angel's message. So all these wonderful things we just talked about, Kellogg, his inventions, what else? The cereals, all these wonderful, oh, a surgeon, perfect stitch. What is all of this without the gospel message? And so God has something to tell us. While all these things might sound very, uh, very well and, and renowned to the world, we should not lose focus on what is the principal work. And the principal work is to proclaim the three angels message. The gospel message as foretold by prophecy had not been an impression on Kellogg's mind. This was not at the forefront of his mind. As we see in the picture there, um, extravagance, um, thinking about self and how he can become more better as a person and not really uh, allowing God to uh, use him to bring forth the message of the last day. Um, so these are, these are lessons for us. These are lessons for us as well, that we remain focused on what God has called us to do, that there is a work to do, okay? And that our talents and our efforts and all the gifts that God has given us is to be poured in to delivering the message. And all these wonderful people that came, presidents that came to um, to to the sanitarium wouldn't it have been wonderful if he was able to sit down and open up a bible study with them and proclaim who jesus was and so um let us remember children that and, and youth that jesus wants our minds to be focused on the, of the gospel all right and so that that ends our mission all right, we are going to transition into our classes, our Sabbath school lesson. And um, if you are age 12 and over, please indicate that on your screen and you will be transferred to the youth class. And if you are um, go up to age 11 and below, um, you will be into the, in the children's Sabbath school. Okay, everyone. It looks like... Mostly everyone has gone into their class. So we are going to start our Bible class. You all excited? You excited to start your Bible class? <laughs> so we've learned lots of interesting things, right, already today. And we're going to have one more thing to talk about today. And that is a touch of faith. So let us pray as we get started with our lesson. All right. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for this day that you've given us and 
just to be here on this Sabbath day with all of the children and families, Lord, is a blessing. And we pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us, to lead us and guide us, Lord. As be, be with me especially and also be with Brother Andrew as we are sharing the lesson, Lord, this day. And we just ask for your Holy Spirit to give us the right words, Lord, to express uh, what you desire to teach the children this day. In Jesus' name we, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So the name of the lesson is A Touch of Faith. So we're going to start out talking about Jesus. So Jesus, remember in our last lesson, Jesus had traveled away, right? He had traveled. He went over the sea where there was a great storm. And he had traveled to a certain place where there was a man that had demons, right? Legions. And what did the people there, when he healed those people, when he healed the man that had a legion of demons, hold on, guys. All right. So when he healed the, the man that had a legion of demons, it was a great thing, right, that he healed this man. But unfortunately, all of those people that were there, what did they say to him? What did they ask him to do? Do you remember? They were afraid, so they asked him to leave. Can you imagine that? Someone actually asked, asking Jesus to leave? So Jesus did just that. And he returned from where he had came from. And this time, when he came to the shore, guess what? Everyone was excited to see him. They were happy. Yes, as soon as he got off the boat, a multitude of people met him. You see the, the, the crowds of people there? Multitude, a whole, a whole bunch of people were there. And they were seeking healing from Christ, comfort. Some people may have had sicknesses. Some people may have been hurting, maybe uh, just different things going on. But Jesus was there and he wanted to, to help, to help all of them. And all of them had come seeking Jesus. Now, there was a particular man. Do you see the man? A particular man who was there. And he fell at his knees, on his knees before Jesus. Can anybody tell me the name of this man? Who knows? Yeah, he is. And I forgot to say it. Yeah, you got it. Okay. You know what? I'm not exactly sure the correct way to say his name either. So I'm just going to call him J Jairus, okay? Jairus. I'm going to go with that, okay? <laughs> so Jairus, okay? Oh, let me get my screen to work. Just a second here. I've got the annotations on, so it's not working correctly. There we go. All right. So Jairus was there. And he fell at the feet of Jesus. Now, Jairus, Jairus wasn't actually just any person in Israel. In Israel, he he's would have... The, he's the leader of the synagogue. That's right. He would have been a very important person, right? He was a, the ruler of a synagogue. What's a synagogue? A church. What's a synagogue? A church. The church. The church in Israel. Say, okay. I, I, JP, um, was that Lemuel? Can you tell me what yeah. a synagogue is? It was the, it's the temple that was burned down. That's right. So you both are correct, okay? The, the synagogue was the place that they went to worship in Israel, okay? So it's kind of like the church, the building. That's what a synagogue was. And Jairus was the ruler of the synagogue. So in Israel, this was a very important person, okay? And you know what? Unfortunately, many people in Israel who were in high places, how do you think they acted? Hmm? How, how do people still act today when they're in high places? Right. Many times they were prideful. They had pride in their hearts. Okay. 
And though this may have been the case with Jairus also, guess what? When he came to Jesus, there was no pride there. This important man fell directly at the feet of Jesus because something was going on in his house. Does anybody know what happened to Jairus? I'm sure we know the story. His daughter was sick. Oh, that's right. So Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. And, oh, his daughter, his beautiful daughter was sick. And guess what? This was his only daughter. So how do you think Jairus felt? Sad. How do you think he felt? How would you feel if your only daughter was sick? And you know what? She wasn't just sick with a little cold. She was at the point of death. Sad. Sad. Sad? Badly sick. Badly sick. She was badly sick. That's right. She was, you would be weeping, right? Noah said weeping, okay? Very sad, very weak, very much in a state of, of sadness, right? Because his only daughter was sick. She was about to die. And you know what? He didn't have any time to waste. He immediately went to Jesus. He pushed all his pride aside and he fell on his knees. And he begged Jesus. He said, Jesus, please, please come to my house for my little daughter. She is sick. She's at the point of death. And I think, let me just add this part. His daughter was 12 years old, okay? And she was dying. Now, what did Jesus do when he heard this message? When he got this sad news, when he saw J.R. is this very sad man, right, before him, begging him, asking him to come to his house. What did Jesus do? How did Jesus react? He was his house. Sad? Pretty much, I think. But like, I'm not really sure. Even though I heard the story, I never saw the face. Okay, no problem. Well, we're going to learn what happened today, okay? So well, I only heard about the Bible. I only read the Bible. I didn't see any pictures or anything. Yeah, well, there's no pictures in the Bible, right? But guess what? That's why we have our imagination, and we can think about all the things that we are hearing and reading about in the Bible, okay? And that tells us exactly what happens, and that's how we get our pictures, because we're just, we're just drawing what, what is there in the Bible, okay? So when Jesus heard it, Jesus immediately decided that he was going to go with, with, with Jairus. Can you imagine that? Even though there was crowds of people there, even though there was many there that were, that were thronging him, the Bible said pushing and pulling at him, right? To, to, heal, to heal them and to give them, uh, give them help from their, from their ailments and sicknesses. Jesus, he, he listened to Jairus. And he decided he was going to come to Jairus' house. Now, do you think that when you come to Jesus, do you think Jesus hears you? Yeah. Can yeah. I see your hands? I want to see the hands of everybody who thinks that. Yeah. Jesus, even though there may be many, many people in the world, do you know that when you pray, Jesus always hears you? He loves to hear you. And when you pray, he knows exactly who you are. And he knows exactly what's going on in your life. He knows who your mommy is. He knows who your daddy is. Guess what? He even knows all the little hairs on your head. He knows, he, he, he knows them. He numbers them. He gives each and every one of them a number. And he loves you. And when you ask him something, he hears you. And he desires to help you just like he made up his mind that he was going to help Jairus, okay? So immediately, immediately, Jesus decided to come with Jairus to his house. Now, how do you think that went, though? As, J as Jairus and Jesus were going, they actually went pretty slowly, it says. Why do you think, 
Why do you think it didn't happen very fast? Why do you think they didn't get to the house very fast? Because of the crowd. Because of the crowd? Tell me more. Oh, I think it was the woman that touched these, and, and then Jesus looked back and said, who would touch me? I didn't know the rest of the story. Oh, you know, you got it, okay? But, they, but there was a crowd around him, right? There were many people, as usual, all around Jesus, okay? And everybody also wanted to, to wanted help from Jesus. And do you think Jesus is going to pass them up? No, absolutely not. So Jesus was there helping everyone that came to him with an earnest heart. He, does, he wanted to help them and he lovingly helped them, okay? And while he was there helping others, guess what? There was also someone else in the crowd. So there was a woman in the crowd. That's right. DP is going to tell us the story. It's, it's okay. So there was a woman in the crowd. So I want you to look in the crowd of people. Can you, can you find the woman? This one, this one. This can you one. find it? This one, this one. There's a clue. And she's pretty old, I think. Okay. I'm going to put a circle around her so you can see her. You see the woman now? Yeah. That's the woman that we're talking about. Okay. Now somebody, I need to hear about this woman. Because this woman has a very important story. Okay? She has an issue of blood. <laughs> Tell me more. Tell me something about this woman. Uh, the woman was very ill and the doctors did the doctors couldn't do anything with her and she was six she was sick for more than I forgot years. Like okay. it hasn't, well, I got, what? Thirty years I think. Huh. <laughs> That's uh, quite I think I heard someone in the background say 12. That's my brother. Yeah, your brother was right, okay? She was sick for 12 years, okay? So she had a very bad sickness. She had been to the doctors, but did the doctors heal her? No. Oh, no. She had been... And, and see, even um, those that said, oh, you know what? Some people, they came, you know, and they said, you know what? Why don't you try this? I heard about this that might help you. But guess what? She tried it. She spent all her money trying it. All her money. She said, okay, I'll, I'll pay money, right? So I can try, so I can try all those remedies. Yes. Right? Yes, the remedy. So she got the remedy, and guess what? The remedy was almost empty. <laughs> but what happened? Was she healed? No. She tried to. So somebody it. told her about the cure. The organic cure. And guess what? It's organic. Okay. <laughs> somebody told her about the cure. Yeah. And she oh, loves organic things there very much. Yeah. So it must be good because it's organic, right? So she went and she said she paid all her money to try to get the cure. But guess what? What happened? It did not work. It didn't heal her, okay? She did everything that she could to try to be healed for 12 long years. But nothing was working. Nothing was helping her. Nothing was removing the sickness from her body. And guess what? Now, she was growing weaker and weaker. She was very distressed because of the sickness. And there was nothing that she could do, it seemed. So you know what? When she heard that Jesus was there by the seashore, she decided that she was going to try Jesus. She had tried everything else, and it didn't work. The remedy? The, <laughs> the remedy didn't work, okay? She tried the cure, and it didn't work. She paid all her money, and now all her money was gone. But still, she was sick. So she decided to go out to see if she can find help from Jesus. So when she went out there, there were so many people 
It was almost impossible for her to get to Jesus. You see, somehow Jairus got, a, got an audience with Jesus, right? But she, she couldn't get there. Remember, she was sick, so she must have been feeble, right? It was, she was probably very weak also. And it was hard for her to get to Jesus. And unfortunately, she felt like there was nothing that she could do. So finally, just when she was about to give up hope, guess what happened? Jesus came her way. Jesus came her way near to where she was. And she realized this is her chance. This is her moment. All she has to do is get to Jesus. And you know what? It's hard to think what we might say or do when we're in the presence of Jesus, right? I don't know if you guys remember, there's an old song, I heard it today, that said, I can only imagine, that, that was the name of it. But in the song, they talk about, I, I can't even imagine what I would do when I'm face to face with Jesus. It says, will I be able to speak at all? And I don't know, this woman, I don't know if she could speak in the presence of Jesus, but what could she do? She can be touched Jesus in his, um, uh, what is it called? Nope. Robe. That's right. And also, she could have got trampled by the people that are there. <laughs> that, that, that didn't happen, okay? <laughs> Thankfully. Okay, Joseph. She decided. She decided that she was going to reach out and touch the hem of his garment. Just a little touch. Just touch the border of it. That's what a hem is. It's the edge of your clothing, right? So she's going to reach out and just touch it. Just touch it. And when she touched it, guess what happened? Can you guys see her touching it? See her touching it? She was healed. Yay. <laughs> Immediately. Immediately, her sickness left her, and she was completely healed. You think she was happy? Yeah. Absolutely. Remember? She tried the remedy. <laughs> she had tried the cure, and none of these things happened. None of these things helped, right? But you know what she didn't try before? Jesus. She didn't try Jesus, right? She didn't try Jesus. Because who is the only remedy? Jesus. Okay? Who is the only cure? Who's the cure? Jesus. Only Jesus. Okay? And while these things may help, right? When, pe when people tell us of natural remedies that we can try, right? They're, it's very good. There's nothing wrong with that. You should try it. It is good for our health, right? But we have to realize we cannot separate the cure and the remedy from Jesus. It is only Jesus who gives us healing. The answer is him. Now I have to ask you though, what unlocked the healing? Perfect. Faith. That's right. Good job, Leah. It was only her faith that unlocked it, okay? So, it, the, the desire of ages says it was the faith of her life. So, everything, with every ounce of her heart, with every ounce of her faith, she gave it to Jesus, right? She reached out to him with everything that she had. And that, my friends, is earnestness. That is the definition of earnestness. With everything she gave, she reached out in faith. And she gained who? Jesus. And what did Jesus give her? The remedy. Jesus gave her healing. Okay? But do we get it? I want to make it clear. 
the remedy is Jesus. And when we seek Jesus, Jesus gives us healing. Okay? All right. So we're going to, next week, we're going to go into more of what happened. Because guess what? Even though it seems like the story is over, it's not over. This ah. is a double miracle. Okay? And they are linked together. So you have to be here next week to hear the rest of the story by God's grace. Okay? So let us pray, and then we'll open it up for any questions. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for the lesson, Lord, that you've given us today. We pray, Lord, that you help us to have faith in you, to know that our healing is only in you. It's not in, it's not in the natural cures or the remedies, Lord, that, that we hear of, but it is in you. And we thank you for these helps that you give us, Lord God. But we pray, Lord, that you help our faith to grow that you help us to know you for ourselves and know that no matter what we are facing, Lord, you can help us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.